Welcome back to the Korean Art Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and this is the tail end of our literature series. And today's guest has been well worth the wait in this regard. This is Ellie Choi. Ellie is a visiting assistant professor of Korean media and culture at Brown University. And today we're going to focus heavily on her research regarding one author in particular. This is Yi Kwang Soo, perhaps the most famous Korean author of the colonial period and afterwards. And we're going to focus on two books in particular of Yi. The first of which is Heartless, and this is often considered as Korea's first full-length modern novel. It's a look into the politics of the time and Korean nationalism, a focus on the colonial center of Seoul and the differences from there represented to the countryside and traditional Korean life. But of course, this is also a focus on modernization. This is not just a look at the occupying power, but at old Korea versus new Korea, and a realization that Korea must change. It must keep up with the world in some way, and the world is moving fast. And this same theme runs across the second book we're going to look at. This is On National Reconstruction, which is a lot more analytical and a deeper look into how Yi considers Korean nationalism and the changes necessary within Korean life. But also importantly, through looking at both these novels, we're going to focus on the life and the work of Yi in general. This is the man who penned the 1919 February 8th Student Declaration of Independence, which went on to spark the March 1st anti-Japanese demonstrations. This is a man who then had to flee to Shanghai, from where he served in the exiled Korean provisional government. But also a man who returns to Korea in 1921, continues his fabulous career as a writer and an editor and a publisher. And it is incredibly hard to understate just how important his career was in the broader literary landscape. But what most people will remember Yi for, and have some inkling of what he is about, is that soon afterwards, as this colonial period dragged on, he is the same person who was considered a traitor, a collaborator with the Japanese. And of course, we're going to look at that as well. Why this was said, just what he did, what line he was trying to walk between Korean nationalism and Japanese colonial domination. This is just such an interesting look into the period and the life of such a writer, the impact that he had and the stain that has lingered over him ever since. It drags up uncomfortable questions about nationalism, morality and history and still ask pertinent questions about Korean identity today and how it manifests and how it deals with this past and this history. But from here out, I'm going to let Ellie walk us into the story itself. Now, I took my research for this particular podcast from three articles of Ellie's that I'm going to link below. But she has done a lot more work on Yi and a lot more work on this period and on Korean literature. So I'm going to link below those three articles, but I do encourage you to go ahead and look at her broader work and read through it for yourself. You are not going to be disappointed. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. We've made a conscious decision here in the Korean Art Podcast not trying to advertise in, in any way. So if you like the podcast, if you listen to it and you want it to continue, it is important that you go to the links below and support us however you can. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And all the help in this regard is also very important. On that, and to walk us through the work of Yi Kwang Su, this is Ellie Choi. <music> Ellie Choi, welcome to the Korean Now Podcast. Thank you, Jed, um, for hosting me. I'm delighted to be able to share my research with you. Well, I was uh, delighted to read through so much of it in the week or two before the podcast. It, it's so fascinating. I knew about Yi Kwang Soo a little, but only in passing. And this week I've been really deep into that work and that period. So before we get started... Who was Yi Kwang Soo? Uh, we're going to speak about this a lot in the podcast, so it doesn't have to go into too much detail, but it, he's a writer that has holds this really prominent place still in Korean life. He's really quite prominent still, but also very controversial. So who was he and why the controversy and why does he remain so uh, prominent uh, still today? Yes, so Yi Kwang Soo is um, one of those figures that continues to confound um nationalist identity production. He, um, as most people know, uh, was triply famous. He participated um, in the student demonstration from Tokyo, where he was an international student, um, by writing the February 8th student declaration, which eventually sparked the famous March 1st movement of 1919. And then he, then before that, he had also written what is Uh, remembered in Korean literary history as Korea's first mature modern novel. He was very much a celebrity by the time he had written um, Mujong or The Heartless, which is the first modern novel of Korea in 1917. And third, he 
then becomes very notorious for being one of those um, collaborators who were very true to the independence cause or perceived to be, and then were seen to have kind of declared um, themselves in support of the Japanese war effort in 1939. So he's one of those figures that one can't um, help but discuss in any Korean literary or history conference. Even today, you see a tremendous amount of Iwangsu name dropping or quoting from Iwangsu, one of the authorities. But yet, um, people are very divided on their evaluation of him. So let's go straight to that uh, novel that you mentioned in there, this this first uh, full-length uh, great Korean novel, which is The Heartless. So uh, what was the novel in broad strokes? We will get into it again, but what was this novel and uh, why was it so important at this time? And then we'll build out the story through a few more questions. Yes, well, as um, was the case in a lot of early modern um, national settings, the novel um, is a Bildungsroman. It's a novel of development of a male um, student, uh, similar to um, The Swords of Young Werther or even Kokoro in Japanese literature. These are kind of um, typical subjectivities or tropes or figures, protagonists. And so the novel um, opens in a soul in transition um, during the uh, annexation period of Japan, when co uh, Japan colonized Korea. As you know, Japan colonized Korea from 1910 to 1945, and the novel opens um, in Seoul around 1910. And the protagonist is, is Young Shik, and he was a semi autobiographical um, figure, very similar to um, Lee Gwang Soo and his cohort, who um, went abroad to Japan as one of the earlier um, generation of international students to study abroad. And they, uh, similar to, let's say, Gandhi, who went who studied in England, came back to their homeland, um, Korea in this case, and really pioneered the modernization and nationalist movement back in their homeland. And so this um, novel is actually an earlier work because Wang Su was still a university student when he published um, Wu Zhang or The Heartless. It's been translated instantly by his granddaughter, Anne Lee, through Cornell University Press, and it's um, luckily available to us in the English translation. But um, Yi Wang Su at the time was in college, and it captures the experience of a young colonial intellectual who travels back and forth from Tokyo the seat of um, what's perceived as the Asian civilization during the Japanese empire and home in Seoul. Um, and it also is typically read as a love triangle story between um, uh, Young Che, Pak Young Che, Young Che, whom he runs into on the street in um, Seoul, who had been his love interest. Uh, back in the north. So Yi Hong Shik, the protagonist, is originally from northern Korea before division near Pyongyang. And then he is, when he runs into Yang Che uh, in a complicated way, kind of already in a new romantic relationship with Son Yang, last name Kim, Kim Son Yang, who is a daughter of a very wealthy, um, entrenched landowning class um, man who believes in modernization in Seoul. So the novel um, is typically read as a development novel of the character of Yi Hong Shik as he na negotiates his relationship between Han Young, who kind of is set against Seoul, which is very much a city of the future and modernity, and Yang Che, who is representing his past and his also local origins in a forgotten kind of north. And so as the novel develops, we find that the protagonist um, is framed against Tokyo, where he had just returned from study abroad, Seoul, where he is um, now working, and then also in Pyongyang, the northernly home where he is originally from. So the novel is framed against these three kind of locales. 
that's a really interesting way to look. And of course, you mentioned there it's about uh, so much. Of this is about this modernizing nation and a nation in development and also under colonial rule. And but there's a part that you mentioned there that that you did put in your research, which I found really interesting. When you speak about uh, the love triangle, uh, Yi Kong Su seems to write about this in in terms of the ex- you write the exploration of free love, and mm-hmm. you write it's a it's a badge of of not just modern subjecthood, but it's also mm-hmm. a challenge to the old Confucian uh, values that he sees as old and decayed and no longer having any animation or shouldn't have any 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 animation. So I might get you to touch on that this place where he stands between the old and the new values there. Yes. So um, others have written about this as well, but this concept of romance and free love. So love, which is a feeling which is removed from a union between two appropriate families or like a marriage contract, a social marriage contract. This idea of romance and love was very much actually a import from the so-called West. So it was a concept that was unfamiliar to the Korean landscape, especially in so-called Yangban or proper um, landed elite families. Which isn't to say that love was not, I mean, people in the late Chosan period and the pre-modern period didn't have romantic relationships. But usually in literature, in the pre-modern period, so-called love was only appropriate between a scholar um, literati, male, usually male figure, and perhaps a female entertainer. So you rarely, very rarely find this notion or even poetry expressing love between, let's say, a yangban or landed elite male and his wife. That would have been inappropriate. So this focus of love, free love, love that uh, comes from feelings or emotions or tongue was very much a revolutionary concept in the social landscape of Mujang or the heartless, certainly. And we should introduce here just what Yi Kang Su means when he talks about the development of Korea, because he is pushing forward a, an idea which uh, wasn't exactly new, but it was developing a very new force at the time. And this was uh, Korean Min Jok. So this is going to run through all of which we speak today when Yi Kang Su speaks about the past and the future and the need to develop a um, uh, uh, the need to develop Korea and the Korean nationalism. He talks about the Minjok. So what exactly is this vision he has of Korean nationalism and uh, how does he see it developing through this concept? So um, this idea of Minjok actually was a neologism that the Japanese Meiji state, which of course um, from 1869 to um, 1912, the intellectuals developed and Minjok actually literally means ethnic um, pride. And it was a attempt to translate this idea, the Western idea of nation. So interestingly, um, Korea didn't have a fully developed idea of Minjok when it was colonized. It was still very much um, at the eve of the late Chosan dynasty, which had lasted from 1392 to 1910. So um, the Korean people were encountered with a doubly kind of challenging task of fighting um, colonialism and articulating who they were in a modern uh, political sense. And that, of course, becomes Minjok identity. And Lee Wang Su, because he was one of the most prominent nationalists and intellectuals at the time, he was one of the leaders who taught the readership, the Korean public, what the Minjok was, what the Korean nation was. And in doing so, he had to differentiate the modern Korean Minjok from the previous Chosan dynasty, which was depicted usually by these early um, East Asian modernizers as decayed and um, corrupt and uh, not really teleologically going anywhere, stagnant. Um, due to what they perceived as a uh, codeism to Great China. So what we're talking about is Confucianism. Confucianism had to be vilified and blamed in order to propel Korean Minjo forward. And Yi Wang Su was really um, one of the kind of um, leaders in this trajectory. And um, so 
Lee Wang Su with his um, senpai or Sambe from Waseda University, Lee Wang Su went to Waseda University. They were instantly the leaders of the Korean Student Association. So they were like, um, you know, the really popular president of the KSA, if you will, if you go to <laughs> any of the colleges today. They were tremendously influential in um, the ways that the student body really felt. And this group was really um, the cultural elite of that generation, right? Because they all had the training now to, and they all felt like they owed it to their people to take what they learned in Japan and apply it for the betterment of the Korean people, which they, you know, whom they perceived were in a crisis because of lack of modernity because of the depravity of and maladministration of the previous Chosun dynasty, and of course, also because of colonization. Let's talk about the title of this book, uh, simply because of uh, its multiple meanings in some ways. So it's called Heartless. And uh, in some ways, uh, Yi Kuang Su, as you write through this, he talks about the future path of his country, and he calls it a heartless trajectory. But there's these mm -hmm. constant moments throughout the book as well when the central character is considering himself to be heartless when he's dealing with the suicide of one of his love interests, for example. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to be that this running theme that perhaps Koreans and the future modernity needs to be heartless, that this may be even an ideal of sorts. And mm -hmm. at the same time, constantly grappling with uh, what that heartlessness means in day-to-day -day life and whether, in fact, uh, they've gone too far and lost themselves. So uh, let's talk about the title and all its import throughout the book. Yes, as you rightly pointed out, the main kind of plot of this um, novel happens when um, Young Tae, his old love interest, discovers that uh, Hyung Shik and Sun Young are betrothed. And she is heartbroken because she realizes that um, uh, Hong Shik no longer has a place for her. So she leaves this dramatic letter saying that she's going to return home to their common um, northern homeland. And um, in, in evocation of a very common literary cultural trope in Korea, throw her body into the Taedong River, which of course is the central river in Pyongyang, and leaves this kind of dramatic note and then takes the soul uh, Uiju, Seoul um, train, which takes her north. She hops on the train and goes north. And then Hyungshik, when he reads this letter, is alarmed and hops on the next train, also north, and runs after her. And then he run he walks around Pyongyang with another former acquaintance who had worked with Yangche and is unable to find her. And then he is portrayed at this point as kind of indecisive and perhaps lacking in loyalty that he doesn't make such a huge effort to um, find Young Che. And his return back to Seoul is in some ways remembered as the correct move, of course, because Korea and Hyungshik we're very much looking towards the future, towards the minjo futurity of modernization. But there is this kind of disloyal um, uh, feeling, this guilt that Tongshik expresses on the train. And he's looking back towards Pyongyang as he's going on the train to Seoul. And he feels as if he's being so heartless that he's basically abandoning his search for his past. And, um, and Young Che certainly represents his past and maybe even Confucian loyalty um, and tradition. And then he's going towards modernity because Han, Han Young's father, Elder Kim, the wealthy Seoul resident, landowner, he had promised that when Hyung Shik and Han Young get married, he would fund their study abroad in America. And so they were planning not only to get married, but also to move to America, which, of course, is depicted in the literature of East Asia at this time as um, a land of future, you know, walking off into the sunset, that kind of trope. So I, I do feel that um, the heartlessness is expressed in other literature of this time. There's a travelogue which Yi Gansu wrote from Tokyo to Seoul, and it depicts him leaving his friend at the train station and saying, 
Dongseng or little brother, don't call me heartless because we can't be, you know, uh, mired in these feelings. And he says, we need to be bold and heartless so that we can man the task of nationalism and we can help our people. So in some ways, you can read this notion of Mu Zheng. Mu means nothing and Cheng means feeling. So it's translated as heartless as um, what may be modernization, nationalism, and even capitalism requires of the modern subject. Um, to relinquish the past, locality, um, superstition, and really move towards the future in a determined way. And so Yi Wangsu's vision of Minjok was what's, what I call vanguard nationalism. He believed that um, young, educated men and women, modern women, modern girls, uh, and modern boys needed to be really the vanguard of the nationalist movement in a cultural and political sense. And of course, later, he this kind of philosophy, political philosophy, becomes remembered as cultural nationalism or moderate nationalism. Now, that's an important point that I'd like to drill into here because it runs through so much of his work that uh, it the idea that there are uh, some Koreans who are educated and knowledgeable enough that are the vanguard. Uh, this concept really is deep inside his work. It, it almost sounds elitist at some points to a modern ear like mine when I was reading this novel and through your research here. It, it, he, he talks about the need to educate, as in uh, we must first give the Korean people science, we must give them knowledge. It, it's, 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 it's all very um, a top-down approach to enlightenment in a sense. And it also, you, this is point which you mentioned and are here, which is important, when this is a uh, natural uh, disaster, a flood, and there's this huge destruction. And of course, uh, a lot of what is being blamed here is that Korea is a backward country, and that's why there's so much pain and suffering because of this. And the students, they come forward and they have this impromptu concert. And again, it's all very elitist as this, um, a top-down approach, an educational approach to, to, to the Korean people. So am I reading this wrong? Or does Yi Kwang Su look uh, not down, but in this top-down approach towards uh, Korean development and Korean nationalism? So yes, yes and no. <laughs> um, so definitely this idea of vanguard leadership is elitist because um, you know, the people who had the educational um, background and also the financial background to conduct their study abroad and also to acquire Western education um, were of the elite class. Certainly, that is the case. Um, so in the penultimate flood scene at the end of Mujang, um, it turned out that Young Te hadn't passed she hadn't committed suicide. She had been rescued by Hongwook, this modern girl who decides to take her on as a protege. And everybody is on a train ride. So Hong Shik and Han Yang are on the same train to en route to America. Yang Che is on the same train going to Tokyo. And they run into each other coincidentally on the train. The train be, be, uh, being a symbol of modernity in these early 20th century uh, development novels in a lot of cultural settings. And the train is forced to stop midway because there is a flood in um, a rural area. And there, the people, the poor people of Korea, the everyday people, the commoners, are depicted as almost a landscape. Um, a poor landscape which needs to be reconstructed or changed and given life. And so the landscape of the poor is depicted as very pathetic. There's a lot of tears, people dying of flooding. And the young uh, people who are on the train are depicted as being awakened to a collective love for these poor people the poor commoners of Korea and feeling united with these people. And so then they put together an impromptu fundraising concert to raise money 
and they become united in this moment of national awakening where their political consciousness is awakened and they are now even more emboldened to uh, man the task of nationalism and social service in their heart. So that's actually a very famous theme that you pointed out from the heartless. Um, so yes, so my answer to your question is yes. However, um, if you look at most nationalist movements and most um, social movements across the globe during this time, they're usually manned by young college students. Um, certainly even the Marxists, the communist movement, the Bolshevik revolution in 1917, um, the young students had a tremendous um, role to play in that movement. And so, um, number one, and then number two, um, the idea of nationalism, as certainly Benedict Anderson talks about it, um, comes when there is a sense of imagined community. And that comes from the ability of people to read the newspaper through the birth of like print capitalism. And so Benedict Anderson says that it's by um, literate people who are able to read um, the vernacular. So not classical Chinese, but vernacular and pick up the newspaper every day. Um, it's, it's by that act, the daily act, the daily synchronicity of picking up the newspaper every day, which is printed in the vernacular, that people are given a sense of this community of a nation. And he calls that, of course, um, the imagined community, which means, which is his definition of nationalism. And so for um, this early modern setting, those people who could read newspapers, who could read hunger, which in the Korean context was the unification of written um language and spoken um, language, those people were actually elite because the illiteracy rate in colonial Korea during 1917 was probably over 90%, right? So by definition of the nature of literacy and by the, de by the nature of writing itself as an elite act, you can't help but create this kind of, you know, vanguard leadership. I don't know if um, I'm answering your question in a very kind of complicated manner. No, I, it, it, yeah. yeah, it did come through quite clearly. It really did. Um, I, but you did mention every time we speak, it seems we're talking about travel throughout this book. And I kept thinking when I was reading this and your research that uh, scenery and travel is so important here. So uh, it, 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 of course, it begins and it, um, it begins with a look at the mountainsides and uh, the trees have been stripped away. There's four train trips. There's They visit the ferry when they see the flood happening. Uh, I'm, I wonder how important this is. As a, It's almost like a, a travel document at some point. And you contrast it through your research with another book of Yi Kong Su. It's called From Tokyo to Seoul. And mm -hmm. it's published in the same year. And again, it's a travel log of sorts. It describes this travel across the country. So mm -hmm. why is travel so important here for Yi Kuang Su? Um, so, uh, so the articles that you have um, chosen to kind of frame this um, Skype interview, I think are um, kind of a window into my book project, which is actually called Travel and the National um, imagination. Um, so Yi Wang Su is usually not really studied as a travel writer, but my kind of contribution to the field of Yi Wang Su studies is precisely that. I look mainly at his travel logs. And I think travel was very, very important in so many ways because travel was a badge of modernity. It was a badge of status. In the pre-modern era, Peasants never, very rarely left their local um, locale. And so it was very, very hard to leave where one was born. Um, and in the modern era, of course, modernity happened with the um, advent of these um, technologies of mobility, the train, like Matthew Perry's, you know, ship. Mm. Warship that landed in Yokohama in 1950, which opened Japan, right? 
and before yeah. that, the Portuguese sailors and the Spanish sailors and the British sailors, the Victorian Her Majesty's Army. So all of um, the late 19th century on was really the era of travel, of travel writing and um, travel, travel observations. And what is rarely really depicted in the ling English language literature um, and what is rarely captured are the subjectivities of the colonized, right? So you have, um, you know, people like Isabella Bird Bishop and members of the Royal Geographical Society in England who wrote many, many prolific travelogues. But in the English language, um, it's hard to find translations of colonial subjectivities. So people like Iguang Su, who are elite in their country, but invisible in the larger imperial centers like Tokyo, right? So comparable would be like Ho Chi Minh in Paris or Gandhi in London, right? They were nobodies in London and Paris, even though they're national giants um, in their countries, right? So travel, I think, is very, very important in bringing an awareness of national and colonial difference. So it, it is one of those things that really Im impress upon the traveler the difference between self and other. And you, you of course, um, see it even today, right? So um, for me, I'm a Korean American. I, I'm in my 40s right now, but I've lived in a, uh, America since I was seven. And I'm noticing every time I go back and forth from Korea, in America, my identity um, experiments or my ident the questions about identity get sharper. So I think travel really has a way of um, invoking these kind of questions of identity, culture. And in the case of Yi Wang Su, his writing is extremely visual. So a lot of people like Michael Shin, who's my sambe in Yi Wang Su studies, He's talked about the birth of the Korean landscape through Mujang. So landscape, identity production, capitalism, mobility, colonialism, they all get imbricated in travel. It was just immensely important in the early 20th century. So while we focus on travel, we should focus on uh, how Yi Kong Su sees uh, the country around him, his place within it. So the central character in The Heartless uh, eventually thrills his struggles, eventually goes back to his northern home. And he, as he gets closer and closer and as he uh, sees his cousins and as he eats the food, he begins to again uh, feel at home in that place, uh, in that place away from Seoul. And a lot of his writing seems to be this disconnect between Seoul, where every prominent writer seems to have to move to make their living, and the North, which he idolizes. And uh, I, I, we, we should enter another article of yours at this point, which is um, one about Northern writers. So he was part of this, or, this organization, this group of writers who self-identify themselves as Northwesterners. And again, their writing had this, despite being based in Seoul, they really romanced their northern homelands throughout this. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's open up that aspect of Yi Kuang Su. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, I don't think that most conventional scholarship on Yi Kuang Su talks about um, the northern home. I, I think, I believe I'm the first person um, in, at least in America, to talk about the northern images in the um, Mujang. So traditionally, I think people have in the industry and in colonial literary studies have been obsessed with distinguishing between um, Yi Wang Su the Korean and Yi Wang Su the collaborator. So this kind of tension between so-called Korea and so-called Japan has really dominated colonial studies. And, uh, you know, my because I am very interested in issues of spatiality and travel, when I read Mujang, it was actually kind of belated. I did a lot of other texts of Iwang Su. Um, I, I've written on the Diamond Mountains. I've written on his, you know, on national reconstruction, his political ideas. But I visited Mujang last because I felt like I had very little new to say because it's one of the most studied texts in Korean literary history. And when I read it again, um, as a more mature scholar, 
because of my interest in spatiality, I started noticing all of these under acknowledged um, uh, passages about hometown, Kohyang, which of course, you know, in East Asia is an extremely, extremely important, evocative cultural trope, Kohyang or hometown. And so I started to no notice that his depictions of his subjectivity in Seoul and Tokyo are very kind of alienated, cold, and um, dislocated. So there's no warmth. There are, I, there are depictions of being lonely, being cold, feeling stressed. And, you know, in his travel writings set in Tokyo, there are a lot of depictions of um, flanerism. So an outsider looking at the Tokyo city streets, just observing, right? But I noticed that in Mujang, which usually has been read as kind of this forward-looking depiction of modernity and the future, I noticed that his writings about the North were imbued with such warmth and authenticity. And not only that, like intimate knowledge, which he doesn't really have in his depictions of soul. So um, I think that this idea of the Northern home is something that is only starting to be uh, studied in colonial literature, because I think for so long, for decades in colonial literary studies, the focus has been on these national concerns of Japan versus Korea, patriot and traitor, co collaborator versus patriot, you know, loyal, loyal versus disloyal. And so I, I'm hoping that this new scholarship, these new readings that I'm bringing into the field of localities will kind of complicate that dichotomy and layer the field. And so um, I really believe, however, for these Northerners, and this idea of Hobogin is actually not a modern um, nomenclature. Hobog, um, the capital of Pyongyang, which is today the capital of North Korea, was remembered in Joseon Dynasty text as Taodo, Western city. And Seobuk is North Pyongyang province. So the people from that region, from the Hongyeongne Rebellion of 1811, I think they already had a very distinct regional identity. And Yi Gwangsu kind of fits into that lineology, even though he's not necessarily remembered for that lineology. And so he's actually um, a mentor to um, writers like Kim Dong-in and um, uh, Peck Stock and even Kim so who are from the North. He's a generation older and he helps to bring about their literature in the 20s and 30s. So from this place, let's step into another one of Yi Kwang Su's books. Uh, this is uh, on national reconstruction. And again, I think it's only a couple of years after he publishes The Heartless. And, mm -hmm. But this is a much more explicit uh, look at this, this, this challenging concept of national reconstruction and what should happen and how it should happen. This is a, a, not just a thing that he was dealing with at the time, but the whole world was challenged with at this moment. So uh, I might give you a brief introduction. What was this book and uh, why did he write it and what was the thrust of it before we get into all the small details? Yes. So um, after his student participation in the March 1st movement, Yi Wang Su was, had, ran, all, ran away from university to Shanghai. And as you know, Shanghai in the French, um, French concession was housed the exiled provisional government of Korea. And Yi Wang Su was not the president. The president at the time was Sung Min Rae, who later becomes president of Korea in 1948. And An Chang Ho, who was his mentor, also a Northwesterner, and Yi Dong Hui. So the provisional government is founded in 1919. And it lasts, you know, all through the colonial period. But Yi Wang Su becomes quickly disillusioned with what's going on. The nationalist 
ideals are kind of, they, the leadership of the provisional government can't decide on what to do. And so after the ninth March 1st movement, the nationalist leaders were kind of um, struggling with this feeling of being let down um, by the fact that the independence movement didn't really succeed in this way that they had hoped. And for Japan, the colonial state, um, the Marchers movement is really kind of a PR nightmare globally. It makes Japan look like um, this kind of oriental despotic empire. When the Western Anglo states have kind of moved on from colonialism in a way, Japan now needs to show the rest its Western imperialist brethren that it, it's as modern and civilized in its imperial practices. And so from 1919 on, Japan implements what's taught in colonial history studies as the second period of colonialization. And it's remembered as the cultural policy era. And they bring in um, Saito Mukoto, who is a um, not a military governor general of Korea. And Yi Wang Su is allowed back into Korea in 1921. Nobody knows exactly why he's led back because he's one of the kind of famous leaders of this anti-Japanese movement, right? And so my research and other people's research have shown that Yi Wang Su at this point has started talking to um, somebody that works for the colonial government named Abe Mitsuye. He's a journalist. And they talk about what options the colonial government, I mean, what options the nationalist leadership who don't live in exile, the nationalist leaders who live in Korea have, right? And so Yi Wang Su comes up with this kind of blueprint for nationalism. He's extremely famous already. Um, and he announces this huge kind of statement, this political vision through Minjo Kejoron, or um, this uh, huge treaties called, which I translate as On National Reconstruction. And it's published in Kebyok, one of the new publications which are allowed under the cultural policy era. And in On National Reconstruction, he wants to lays out his and his cohort's vision for Korea's future. And you have to remember that the 1920s is the post-Bolshevik era and the post-1919 era, the post-Wilson Doctrine era. And what, that, what I mean by that is you see globally the rise of the left or communist movements around the globe. And the way that um, Lenin and then eventually Stalin envision communism globally is that communism becomes a tool in their mind to for the downtrodden proletariat brethren across the globe to fight imperialism and colonialism. So for those who are disillusioned with the nationalist movement um, to date in Korea and those who are more radical communism becomes the only way that they can envision this way out of this thing called colonization, right? Yi Guang Su, however, and other leaders of his background who are the moderate nationalists, they don't believe that class conflict that is part of the communist equation is viable for Korea. They also don't believe that the uneducated farming um, classes of Korea are yet ready to handle this thing called nationalism. And this kind of touches upon your question previously about the elitism in Yi Gwang Su's political vision. And so Yi Gwang Su starts to outline his vision for what Korea needs to do. And in On National Reconstruction, he says that Korea is not ready for anti-colonial um, uh, independence uh, activities yet. First, it needs to work on awakening the masses to this idea of na national identity, to this self, which he calls cha a uishik, self-consciousness. 
and then work on things like literacy, capitalist infrastructure, education, and civic organization. And this platform actually is kind of attempted by Yi Wang Su and his cohort. The modern nationalists attempt things like national literature and language society, which um, works on teaching the masses hunger, Korean vernacular language. There's also a national production movement where they try to only buy Korean products to um, grow what they see as national capital as opposed to Japanese capital. And then there's also like a national artisan movement, which tries to, you know, grow like national handicraft, right? And of course, these sound really great on paper, but we all understand the kind of transnational nature of capitalism, right? You can't really conduct capitalist and in capitalism and engage in a global market by distinguishing between Korean capital and Japanese capital. They're kind of messily intertwined, right? So Yi Wang Su is attacked for these articles, these writings or these lines in on national reconstruction, which basically say, let's wait and put the independence issue on the back burner and first work on these so-called cultural products. So, and then he also is attacked for um, criticizing what he sees as a like weak national character of Koreans. And he spent some time criticizing Korean's minjok song or national character, which is also unpopular with his cohort. And so on national reconstruction is read by some as an early precursor of his later collaboration activities. And also because of it, uh, the emphasis that it places on cultural, educational, literacy movements, it's also criticized as a very bourgeois vision for Korean nationalism, which don't really address the needs of the, you know, the agrarian poor, which make up, you know, 90% of Korea at this point. And so it's, it's one of the most studied political treatises, and it's considered um, a political document which drove a wedge between the left and right in colonial Korea, which of course, this wedge is driven in and then it kind of calcifies into national division and the Korean War, right? So this is really one of the kind of uh, political treatises which really explain the problematic, um, problematic discussion at the heart of Korean politics even today. Well, let's look at that wedge a little bit. As you were speaking, I was beginning to get the image in my head of just of of the early seeds of Yi Kwang Su and this uh, and his, uh, I suppose his. Uh, consideration today as a, as a betrayer of, of Korean nationalism. But there's also another element that you mentioned throughout your writing here that must have set a lot of people off at the time. And that is, uh, he does speak a lot about um, um, the importance of uh, liberalization and freedom. And he pillarizes countries like Great Britain and America for their love of freedom. But you write as well, and this is obvious throughout some of this writing, that you write, if one is familiar with Japanese history, it is obvious that Japan, above any other country, evinced the type of, of type of national reconstruction that Yi so admired. And mm -hmm. this is a lot. This is really important here because he looks at the Meiji Restoration and he and he looks at the world in social, as you write, social Darwinistic terms. It's not just the freedom. It's uh, we are where I, we are because we failed to compete and to be strong. We should get out there and compete and be just as strong. So he has this admiration for the Japanese, it seems, throughout this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are a lot of these internal contradictions in the text, right? As you rightly know, he's very, um, he's very at, um, he's very, he's, he respects and admires what he's seeing, what he describes as the trial and error uh, nature of the British constitution. And then we'll turn around and then say things like the French constitution, however, was, you know, 
a stock document which was not through trial and error and therefore it was idealistic and really did not succeed in you know meeting the needs of the post French Revolution population right so he'll, he'll say things like that and that kind of uh, political ideology of course is identified with pragmatist more Anglo uh, political philosophy versus the continental philosophers right and so he does things like that and then he'll turn around and say things which are very, very basically thinly veiled, veiled, um, you know, homages to Meiji nationalist uh, successes, right? So he'll do that. And um, so I think a lot of political economists of East Asia have acknowledged that the so-called four tigers of Asia and you know, not Japan, but uh, also Japan have kind of followed this kind of latecomer developmentalist state capitalist model, which is not really what America and England, the Anglo states have followed, right? So these latecomer Asian countries. And so these countries have really followed what I call illiberal modern developmentalist model. And so Yi Wang Su's on national reconstruction, even though it's full of these political kind of inconsistencies, I think really wants to lead us towards that direction. And so he'll, there are, there are um, kind of these blueprint, very um, disciplining, subjective, subjectivity forming. Um, ideas in the in the treaties, like what time you should wake up and how one should conduct oneself to discipline one's um, subjectivity for success. And there are these kind of like very formulaic ways that um, associations and groups can blossom into larger national successes, right? So those have been kind of read as right-wing political ideals. Um, which even complicates the place of on national reconstruction in Korea's political development. But I think that Yi Gwang Su's idea of capitalism, nationalism, and Park Jong Hee, the military dictatorship's idea, which of course Park Jong Hee is credited with the miracle on the Han, are very similar in their philosophy in that they both admired the Meiji model. And so, you know, they're both controversial in the way that Park Jong-hee, I mean, recently his daughter was ousted from power and the candlelight demonstration, which um, had her ousted from power, what is seen as a, a, is a, um, is a moment of the triumph of Minju ideology, which certainly Yi Guangsu is not um, identified with. <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a, a, a theme that, that you mentioned significantly here that really impacted his work in this book, and that is the work of Gustave Le Bon. And mm -hmm. uh, he writes about um, the crowds and the psychology of the crowd. And mm -hmm. this is seems to be really important for Yi because he, of course, says things uh, like um, it's we need um, uh, uh, de development and change much more than we need autonomous rule. And for many people from the outside, they will say, why are they mutually exclusive? Why must we wait for independence? Why do we have to wait for this uh, this uh, shift to happen inside the country? And uh, it seems that Yi has this image in his mind uh, from people like Le Bon of, of the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror and things like this. And he's uh, fearful. He doesn't think the Koreans are, are ready for this. But also, they're miles away. He at one point says it, it would take 30 years just to get enough people inside this vanguard. So uh, let's go to that moment and this thought of Gustave Le Bon and how influential it was on Yi's thought and his considerations about national reconstruction? So Gustav Le Bon, I think, is um, kind of also misrepresented in history. So what happened was that um, he witnessed firsthand the Paris Commune of 1848. And then I think 
Parisian intellectual landscape became very, very left-leaning. And he was actually um, a very complicated figure. He was very essentialist, so he had um, clear ideas of national characteristics, Japanese versus the French, Turkish, which, of course, is not politically correct, right? You don't really stereotype and essentialize people's national traits. But he also, I think, um, was the first student of crowd mentality. So he's very, very against demagoguery and what he called men a contagion, mental contagion. This cowherd mentality, which he said drove crowds to act sometimes not in its best interest, so one of his earlier works was a criticism of socialism. So in a day when socialism was touted in the intellectual community as the utopian idealist vision and answer to the ills of capitalism, um, Laban presciently predicted that socialism would turn into another form of totalitarian government. And, you know, of course, when, you know, Yi Guangxu was, Quoting from Laban in 1922, Nazi Germany hadn't happened, right? The Third Reich hadn't happened yet. And unfortunately, uh, Laban was no longer alive, but he was not alive to see what happens to communist regimes um, during the Cold War, right? So he is remembered in Western intellectual um, history kind of in this strange light. So it was Stalin and Hitler that read Laban, <laughs> but we don't remember in America that FDR read Laban, and I read somewhere that FDR had Laban on his night table. So there were Western leaders whom we lionize who also read Laban because they were all interested in political movement and galvanizing the crowd, right? But for Yi Guang Su, he kind of takes all of these political ideal political ideals and thinkers from the West, the so-called West, and picks and chooses in a way that sometimes confounds definition, right? But he was really just interested in whatever political ideology he felt would help Korea in this interwar moment between World War I and World War II. And certainly Laban, he felt was very helpful in galvanizing and bringing awareness of the nation in the Korean population, which was largely illiterate at the time. Uh, let's uh, step into that. So as you're saying that, he, he it's clear throughout Yi Kwang Su's writing that he cares deeply about his nation. This is the uh, anime theme so much of his life. So let's mm -hmm. talk about how, as we get to the end of the uh, interview here, let's talk about how it goes so wrong for him and why he ends up in the place that he does today. And one of those moments seems to come through, as you mentioned earlier, this critique of him as a bourgeois scholar of sorts. And you use this uh, this wonderful uh, critique, which, 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 which comes his way and is very uh, emblematic of, of the times. And this is from um, the... Uh, the editor of New Life, and this is July 1922, and mm -hmm. the editor writes and calls him a decadent scholar, but he does so in ways that uh, almost have some modern uh, echoes in the way that Koreans still still seem to uh, see themselves and their nationalism. So uh, he he this this editor Shin he criticizes Yi Kwang Su for. Uh, an unflattering, in quote here, an unflattering assessment of Korean civilization. Mm -hmm. he, he talks them down. And he, this, again, the editor talk, talks about Korea's rich 5,000-year-old history. This mm -hmm. is important and still important for Koreans today. It's still one of those national an anime and themes. So what place does um, Yi's denigration of uh, Koreans, of Korean history and Korea's place in the world have on how he is seen today? So... That's the thing. Um, I think if you take any of his treaties or writings um, out of context in, in, and just look at that one text, I think then you get into criticism such as Shin, right? So what's, and you know, because I read widely his works, so if I study what his literary output or, you know, political output in 1922, I'll read everything that he wrote that year and the year before and the year after. 
And what people don't remember is that he wrote one of the most important kind of national culture making travel logs in 1922 within like months or weeks after on national reconstruction. I think three weeks after he goes to the Diamond Mountain, which is one of the it was the crown jewel of Korean mountains. And it's one of the seen as these kind of wonders of Asia. It was a crown jewel of the emerging Japanese colonial tourism industry. And he basically writes travelogue, which ends up sparking a whole kind of field of Diamond Mountains tourism and colonial literature. And so he ends up inventing in so many ways colonial identity through history, um, in through the very kind of historical figures and cultural tropes and beautiful places that him in a very kind of myopic way doesn't acknowledge, right? So he went to when um, in 1910, when he was a high school student, he wrote a poem about Yusun Shin, the general who vanquished the so-called Hideyoshi invasion in 19, um, in 1592 to 1598, 1592 to 98 wars. He writes about uh, Korea's most famous romantic heroine, Chun Hyang, who is Korea's most famous Kisang. A romantic figure. He has a fiction writer on fiction on her. He later um, it almost single-handedly brings back to life the story of Yi Sun Shin. People don't remember, but um, when he was the editor in chief of when he was the editor of a writer for the Chosun Ilbo, or the Korea Daily Daily News in 1931 or 32, I believe. Um, Yi Sun Shin. Uh, uh, descendants, uh, he had discovered, uh, become so in debt that the uh, ancestral lands which paid for ancestor worship of Yi Shin were about to go to the creditors. And he went to and his journalist friends find out about it. And they go visit Yi Shin's family and all of the places that Yi Shin made history at. And he basically collects money. He spearheads this national movement to collect money from the Korean colonial population to save East Hanshin ancestral land. So contrary to what Kim kind of myopically criticizes, Iwangsu does not belittle Korean identity. I think what Iwangsu does, and many of the nationalists during this period too, he reroutes Korean genealogy away from, you know, Chosun based genealogy and really emphasizes Tangun. Um, Yi Sun Shin, and a lot of kind of these illustrious figures that today have been solidified into a very kind of strong nationalist identity. So, as a last question, let's talk about his um, um, explicit collaboration. So, mm -hmm. again, so he, you, there's, there's a chapter here in one of your articles talk about the, how he was co-opted co by the colonial state. And but throughout some of his early writings, you also write that he he is desperate not to mention them. He doesn't mention the colonial state because, of course, he doesn't see it as the most important thing in the re-energization of of Korean life. So, mm -hmm. uh, how was he co-opted? It, it seems that it was through connections from his own his old Japanese days. And how deep and thorough was this? I'm wondering um, uh, when we look back on this period, how real. Is the criticism of Yi Kwang Su as a uh, this man who has betrayed the the cause of Korean nationalism, or is it that he is um, uh, loosely affiliated with certain figures and he was operating within a system and he really didn't have much choice? I wonder how you see this uh, uh, this uh, potential co co collaboration now as we look back on it and why he is uh, considered such a villain in uh, in the cause of Korean nationalism. So I think Yi Wang Su is very different from kind of nationalist traders like Yi Wan Yong, who was one of the um, politic, uh, government leaders in 1910 who spearheaded Japanese annexation and really kind of strong armed King Kuo Jung into letting Korea be annexed in 1910. So he's like um, irreparably damaged in Korean nationalist. Lore, right? Yi Gwangsu is a bit more complicated. 
And other Sambe scholars of mine who are Igbonsu specialists, they've described him as a wound in Korean identity. So he was the best of the best, right? He occupied a very central place in colonial um, intellectual sphere, you know, a place like the editor-in-chief of the New York Times, or I, I can't even name such a central position right today, but he was really an important figure. And he was a very active nationalist. So he worked with another lion in nationalist movement, An chang -ho, um, for the nationalist movement, worked very hard. And, you know, he had been jailed a couple of times for his political activity. So the fact that he did this 180 in 1939, and then he starts to tour and write things in Japanese language, asking young people to sacrifice themselves for the Japanese empire and the Japanese war effort, right? So is really seen as an abrupt betrayal. But he, and it wasn't even that he was, you know, just following along in the um, great East Asia. He was the leader of the literary group in colonial Korea the first leader, which the Japanese co-opted and formed to bring all of the intellectuals and the elite in line with the empire. So he was a central figure in that kind of uh, uh, 180 movement in 1939. Um, so there's that political, like, abrupt 180. Right? And I think my research kind of complicates that a little bit. You know, it's kind of like asking somebody like me I speak, I speak, I, you know, I'm fluent in Korean, but it's my heart language for things that I say in Korean, which I can't really say in English because it just doesn't feel the same. But I am in my pu public persona, in my academic professional life, I'm very fluent, much more fluent in English. So it's kind of like asking somebody like me to choose between Korea and America, right? It's this kind of bifurcated identity that's in between this this, what I call alterity. So for me, I look at pe people that are not acknowledged, Japanese figures who are not acknowledged in his student years. So I had mentioned briefly Iwansu's relationship with Abe Mitsuye. He was the second in command of the colonial publication sphere in, who worked under Tokutomi Soho, who the first governor general of Korea um, uh, Terauchi brought with him to Korea in 1910 to kind of whip the colonial publication sphere, you know, in line. And Abe Mitsuye worked for Tokutomi Soho. But Abe Mitsuye was, is remembered not really as a villain in colonial Korean history. He's remembered as a Buddhist leader, and he had real kind of what's perceived as authentic relationships with key colonial figures. And this relationship is kind of swept under the rug because it doesn't really fit in with the master narrative of Korean nationalism. So I look at things like that and I look at um, what it must have been like for Yi Gwangsu going back and forth between Tokyo and Seoul. And I really do believe that, you know, a lot of these young intellectuals who really came into uh, maturity in the imperial capital, the question was really not that easy. So my answer to that question is, you know, a little bit more complicated. Yilong Su himself publishes an apologetic after um, colonialism is over, after Korea gains its independence called My Confessions, Naya Kubek. And he says that when his mentor, An died in, I think, I believe he died in 1936. And then his mentor, Japanese mentor, Tokutomi Soho also died. He's kind of lost the rudders. I mean, he's kind of lost the kind of um, uh, signpost in his life. And he really felt that Japan would never liberate Korea. Liberation would never happen. And for Korean intellectuals, unless they collaborated, they would all be jailed or executed. So he really did not have a choice. 
Now, for <coughs> more left-leaning um, scholars today, I think that's not an excuse. I think um, there's this idea that if you were really a true patriot, you would have left Korea and lived in exile in Manchuria and, you know, you know, like Syngman Rhee maybe lived in America and Hawaii and really fought the fight. But the conditions in the late 30s were untenable for these nationalist leaders. You couldn't even go to a bank without so-called collaborating, right? Because the infrastructure was so entrenched and intertwined. So the question is really, really complicated. I think the reason that we're asking this question, the question is says more about Korean nationalist identity production and what nationalist identity production has meant since the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. And I think um, Kunda Kuster, I was just reading, he's a colleague from Europe. He has um, written a wonderful essay called Exercising the Nation, Exorcising the Nation. And it gives like a thorough historiography, graphical kind of survey of the idea of collaboration and how it came about. And really is a post-war, post, you know, Park Jung era project, which is kind of um, the Korean nation shooting itself in the foot insofar as the Korean nation couldn't have survived without fully engaging in this global inevitable project of capitalism. And this project of vilifying collaboration is a project of vilifying those capitalists in the colonial state who had to work in this global capitalist market. And so it's really just kind of this, you know, lose-lose situation in my, in my, there's no way out of it because the founding leaders, the landowning class of Korea and in a lot of post-colonial states were all kind of, you know, collaborators with the previous colonial state. So, so it's tragic, uh, yeah. Mm, that is a, a, a wonderfully um, a nuanced point to leave the podcast on. Um, all the articles that I used for research for this, I'm going to link below. Uh, we didn't get to hardly any of the detail. They're so rich. There's so much more there that we could have spoken about today, but we just couldn't squeeze them into a single podcast. So for listeners, I do encourage you all to go and read them for yourselves. You won't be disappointed. They really are fascinating looks, not just into the life of Yi Kong Sri, but other scholars and the period and, of course, Korean nationalism, how it develops throughout those years. On that, Ellie Choi, thanks for coming on the Korean Art Podcast. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to talk about all of these um, <laughs> difficult ideas and also my uh, own personal research. I really enjoyed um, talking to you, Jess. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening.